Hello and welcome to our first video of a two-part series on tropical cyclone structure. In this video we want to take a look at the structure of a mature tropical cyclone. In a lot of regards this video can be viewed as taking kind of a step back. We've gone through a few thermodynamics and dynamics heavy uh, lectures in the past couple of weeks. Now we want to take a little bit of a step back and look just at broader structural characteristics. We've already introduced some of these as we've gone along, but we want to give a more complete treatment to the different structural features of a tropical cyclone here before we move on into some of the elements that can cause that structure to change. So let's dig in. So we start by defining this idea of a primary or horizontal circulation. This is the cyclonic circulation at low levels that converges in toward the center of the cyclone. So at low levels here, we have 900 hectopascals in the top two panels. Big area at left, very narrow area right near the center at right. Friction causes air to spiral inward over that large horizontal area. The thin uh, solid lines here are cyclonic streamlines that come in toward the center. You can kind of see these depicted here in the detailed view as well. So you have air spiraling counterclockwise inward toward the center of the tropical cyclone. As you go upward, however, we have 200 hectopascals here in the bottom, big view and narrow view. The cyclonic circulation weakens and consequently also becomes smaller in extent. Note that here in the big view, our streamlines look like they diverge and turn clockwise away from the cyclone. But when you move really close into the center, you can still see that these streamlines are directed in a counterclockwise fashion just over this very narrow area here, whereas the larger scale wind is associated with divergent uh, anticyclonic flow. So as you go up through the troposphere, the cyclone's intensity decreases and the area covered by cyclonic flow also decreases. So the strongest winds are found near to the center at what we call the radius of maximum winds. We can see this here at 900 hectopascals by the light and dark gray color shading here. It's not right at the center, which is where I have the laser pointer at this point, but rather a very short distance on the order of 10 to 100 kilometers away from the center at this radius of maximum winds. For the most intense tropical cyclones, this is corresponding to the eye wall, which we'll define in a little bit more detail later on in this video. Video. So let's contrast this with the secondary circulation. So the primary is the horizontal, but flow is not just horizontal around a tropical cyclone. It also moves vertically within a tropical cyclone. So this idea of a secondary circulation characterizes the in, up, and out flow of a tropical cyclone. So here at left, we have depictions of a cross section. This is a horizontal distance. The center of the storm is here at zero and vertical direction, zero to 15 kilometers through the depth of the troposphere here. And on the left-hand side, we have depicted different isobars and isotherms. Temperature decreases going upward, pressure also decreases going upward. So the values for each get smaller and smaller as you go upward. The temperature lines bow upward, so the temperature is a maximum near to the center. Pressure lines bow downward, so pressure is a minimum at a given altitude near toward the center. But we have this thick black set of lines here that flows inward, upward, and outward. And so it's that inflow over that shallow layer near the surface. Note that this is found only right near to the surface. Gently sloped, and we'll describe the why it's sloped outward a little bit later on, tropospheric deep ascent in the eye wall near to the center here with outflow to large radius or large radii near to the tropopause here. This warm thermal anomaly as depicted, note how these dashed contours bow upward right as you get toward the eye and the eye wall here. So this warm thermal, ano thermal anomaly is maximized at mid to upper levels. The slope of those temperature contours is relatively small near to the surface, but becomes somewhat larger as you get to the middle to upper troposphere here. So let's take a look at some of the kinematic fields, looking at it in this radial uh, vertical cross section. So the center of the storm is here at zero kilometers and you're moving to larger distances away from the center as you go to the right on the x-axis. And then we have pressure from the surface up above 100 hectopascals on the y-axis. In the upper left, we have the radial wind, which is the in and out component. It's positive for flow going away from the center. 
we have tangential wind here in the upper right. This is the component that spirals around, tangent to the rotation. And then it is positive for cyclonic flow. And then here at the bottom, we have vertical velocity, of course, up and downward motion. And given that this is in meters per second, we're looking at, and honestly, I think that the contours are a little bit messed up if this is actually meters per second, because these are negative values, which would denote ascent if it was pascals per second. So I think the uh, indicator here on the figure might be wrong. Regardless, let's take these one at a time. So this radial wind here, note that these negative values are concentrated below 850 hectopascals, and they become larger as you come closer and closer to the center of the storm. You have positive values denoting outflow here over a larger distance, but concentrated between 300 and 100 hectopascals. This defines the outflow layer at upper levels. This tangential wind, again, is strongest near to the center, and in the lower troposphere. Not quite at the surface due to the dissipation effects of friction, but just above that surface or boundary layer here. And then it decreases in intensity as you go upward. This zero dashed line here is the outermost extent of the uh, cyclonic circulation. And note how that goes from large radius at low levels to small radius here as you reach to the tropopause associated with the decay of the intensity of the cyclone as you go upward with height as well. And then vertical velocity is concentrated very near to the center with a strong ascent. And then as you get to much larger radius toward the edge of the diagram and beyond, you have very weak descent at those distances there. So that was kinematic structure. What about thermodynamic structure here? We have temperature anomaly here on the left. Again, a vertical cross section from 1,000 to just above 100 hectopascals. And radial here, looking at the center here at zero, going out over about an 80 nautical mile distance in each direction here on the x-axis. We have theta E, equivalent potential temperature here on the second panel in the same type of view. Vertical cross section uh, with pressure on the y-axis and distance from the northwest side to the southeast side of the cyclone over the course of about a 60 mile uh, leg on either side from the center here at zero. So previously we noted that the tropical cyclone has its warm anomaly with maximum amplitude in the upper troposphere. This is where it is warmest relative to the surrounding cooler, drier environment. Since the inertial stability weakens as the cyclone weakens with height, this warm anomaly becomes more radially expansive as you go upward. So here at low levels, below about 500 hectopascals, the cyclonic circulation, the tangential wind is very strong comparatively. So there's a very strong inertial constraint on just how far out that warmth associated with the uh, upward branch of the tropical cyclone secondary circulation can be uh, spread outward. However, at upper levels, the cyclonic circulation becomes much, much weaker and then turns anticyclonic by the time you reach to the tropopause. This has very weak inertial or rotational constraint. And so this heating, while it is still concentrated near to the center, is able to spread outward in terms of sort of those intermediate values of positive temperature anomaly associated with that weaker inertial stability and greater outflow there. And you can kind of see this in terms of theta E as well, noting that the top of this cross section corresponds roughly to the middle of the warm anomaly here in the leftmost cross section here. Note that inflowing air parcels, so if we think about this from the Carnot cycle approximation to a tropical cyclone, we're gaining energy, gaining enthalpy, entropy, moist static energy, or theta E on that inflow leg. And so an air parcel that starts out, out here in the light blue shading is gaining uh, moisture, gaining enthalpy, gaining heat from the underlying ocean very rapidly as it approaches to the eye wall close to the center of the storm. This is given by the very strong winds that are found here, as well as the much lower pressure, which leads to a much higher saturation vapor pressure, so your enthalpy disequilibrium is very large here. So you gain enthalpy, entropy, moist static energy, theta E, as you come inward, and then as you ascend along a moist adiabat, or approximately along a moist adiabat, theta E is approximately conserved. It does not change as you go upward 
through this region. And then as you go outward from there, it only changes very slowly within that outflow region, that outflow leg region there. So let's take a cross section at one height across the cyclone. So in this particular case, we're going to look at 700 hectopascals through a mature hurricane from aircraft reconnaissance data, not from a model simulation or anything like that. Here on the topmost panel, we have a thin line here that depicts 700 millibar height given by the y-axis at right. And we have a thicker black line depicted here that depicts the horizontal wind speed given by the y-axis here at left. Note that as you go from 150 kilometers from the center toward the center or between the center and 150 kilometers on the outbound leg, height rapidly decreases and wind speed rapidly increases as you get close to the eye wall and eye of the cyclone. In this particular case, the 700 millibar wind speed is about 80 meters per second, or on the order of 160 uh, knots, 180 or so miles per hour. The 700 millibar height, as you get near to the center, is on the order of 2200 meters, noting that usually we see it over land here over 3000 meters. So we're looking at something that is incredibly intense relative to what we would typically expect to see at this 700 hectopascal isobaric surface. If we go down to the next panel, which is temperature and dew point, both at 700 millibars, temperature is the top of these two lines and dew point is the bottom of these two lines here. As you come in toward the center, note how temperature and dew point both steadily increase as you go from larger radius toward the center. And then within the eye wall, temperature rapidly increases and then into the eye dew point rapidly decreases. This is because the eye is a region of very strong subsidence sur uh, surrounded by the very strong rising motion within the eye wall. That subsidence within the eye leads to adiabatic compression. Air warms but it also significantly dries, especially from a dew point perspective, as it does so. So you have a 700 millibar temperature that is on the order of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. That's on the order of 78 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit at 700 millibars with a dew point temperature that's on the order of 5 degrees Celsius or about 40 degrees Fahrenheit here. Finally, we go to the bottom panel where we have vertical velocity here given by the thick black trace. It's very close to zero except for two distinct locations. We have one here at about 90, 80 to 90 kilometers radius and one similar to it just a little bit further out. And then we have a positive spike and a negative spike where we had the wind speed, height, temperature, and dew point gradients in our previous panels. So we have larger vertical velocities in the eye wall where we typically have strong rising motion, but also sometimes strong sinking motion as you cross that into the eye. And then here at larger distance, we have the beginnings of what is known as a secondary eye wall forming. And thus convective activity is a little bit stronger here. We can see this depicted by the temperature and dew point being very nearly equal at these radii here at 700 hectopascals. And the 700 hectopascal wind speed is a little bit faster at these locations as well, similar to how it is much faster within the primary eye uh, or primary eye wall in that case. So we can look at this in a little bit more detail. Here's our 700 hectopascal, and this is the gradient wind, which is an approximation to the uh, pressure gradient, Coriolis, and cyclist or centrifugal force balance for the wind. And there are a number of dots along here that depict observations from a tropical cyclone. In this case, Hurricane Gilbert in 1988. We see that at the center, the 700 hectopascal wind is very near zero, and it rapidly increases to over 70 meters per second at a radius of 10 to 20 kilometers away from the center. And then it rapidly decreases such that by the time you're 50 kilometers from the center, it's about 30 meters per second. And it roughly stays there as you go outward to 150 kilometers radius here. So the tropical cyclone's wind profile, whether it's 700 hectopascals or some lower or even higher altitude is characterized by a sharp increase from the center to the radius of maximum winds, 
a sharp but not quite as sharp decrease outward from there to more intermediate wind speeds that then more gradually die off, especially as you get beyond the 150 kilometer radius that is shown here. In the panel here at right, we have the composite tangential wind here in the top, where you're looking at the tangential wind relative to the maximum wind at any given radius. And here we have the radius divided by the radius of maximum winds here at bottom. This is depicting the radius at which you are at divided by whatever the radius of maximum winds is. So you would expect at one, you're at the radius of maximum winds, and so your wind speed would be at its maximum, or one here. We have three different lines. The solid line is for major hurricanes, the dashed is for weaker category one or two hurricanes, and the dotted is for tropical storms. So for major hurricanes, the solid line, you have a more rapid increase in wind speed from the center to the radius of maximum winds, and a more rapid decrease in wind speed away from the radius of maximum winds than you do for minor hurricanes or tropical storms, where this profile that you see here at left is somewhat flatter overall. The maximum is not as high, and the slope of the line to and from the maximum are also not as high. Down here at bottom, we have a measure of the total asymmetry. As you go around the cyclone at a given radius, how uniform is the wind speed? And so for major hurricanes, this metric is down around 0.1 or even less at any of the radii considered, which suggests that there's only about a 10% deviation in terms of the 700 hectopascal or whatever level wind speed you're looking at as you go around the center at any given radius. But if you go to tropical storms, for instance, near to the center, that's between 15 and 20 percent asymmetry or variation around the storm, and then that becomes closer to 12 to 15 percent as you get to larger radii. So for more intense storms, the stronger winds tend to be more uniform around the center, whereas as for weaker storms, they tend to be less uniform around the center. So from here, let's take a look at the key elements of the primary or horizontal circulation in a little bit more detail. And from here, we're going to work center outward. We're going to focus primarily on this inner core region, which is this dotted region that you see here within the first 100 to 200 kilometers away from the center of the storm. And then we'll move to this outer core region that lies outside of that in our later slides. So we start with the eye here, and this is a region that's dominated by descent from very high altitudes. So you have air coming in at low levels toward the center, toward the eye wall, ascending within the eye wall. Most of that then spreads outward within the outflow leg and descends weakly at larger radius. But some of that ascending air comes in and then descends very near to the center. How and why we get eyes, why we even need them for tropical cyclones of a certain intensity, is still an open question within the research community. But nevertheless, looking at it from an observational perspective, eyes are generally cloud-free. You've probably seen one of those images from hurricane reconnaissance aircraft with sort of like this bowl or stadium shape, where you're in a cloud-free region, there's maybe some shallow cumulus very near to the ground, and you're surrounded by the deep thunderstorms associated with the eye wall on every side of you. That's what we see within the eye. So our eye wall is co-located with the radius of maximum winds. This is where we see the ascending branch of the Carnot cycle, the secondary circulation approximation for a tropical cyclone. We sometimes see a secondary eye wall. So note how this primary eye wall is a concentric circle around the eye in this example. And the secondary eye wall is not quite concentric. It's a little bit open to the west and east here and here, uh, but still nearly surrounds the center here. It is separated from that primary eye wall by a region of lighter precipitation, primarily stratiform precipitation, so with relatively low to moderate rain rates. We define this as a moat, and we'll describe this in a little bit more detail shortly, but the characterization of it being like a moat surrounding a castle is true. Stagnant-ish water surrounding a feature on the inside. In that case, a castle. In this case, an inner eye wall. 
the formation of one of these secondary eye walls creates a new location where air ascends as it tries to approach the center. As opposed to coming all the way into the eye wall and then ascending, now some of this air comes in and reaches this new secondary eye wall and ascends there. So it cuts off that inflow toward that inner eye wall, which ultimately leads to it weakening. We'll touch on this in a little bit more detail later on in this video, but this process is known as an eye wall replacement cycle. As we go outward from there, we get to this principal rain band that we see here, kind of in this G shape around the cyclone here. This is generally quasi-stationary, especially if the environmental wind field is constant over the course of time. So relative to the rotating cyclone, this feature may retain this G-like structure around the cyclone. It's characterized by a thunderstorm hierarchy that we'll describe in a little bit more detail later in this video. So down here, you have new cells that have developed and are beginning to mature. And then within this region, you have your mature convective cells. And then as you get downwind here, you get decaying convective cells. You get a more broad stratiform precipitation region given by the light gray shading as opposed to the more convective cells given by the darker gray shading that we see within there. We also see secondary rain bands in some cases, and these are located inward of the principal rain band. There's some theory that suggests that these may be the manifestation of vortex Rossby waves, which we introduced very briefly in our tropical cyclone intensity change lecture, and we're not going to touch on them anymore here in this case. But keep in mind that you will sometimes see inner secondary rain bands relative to this outer principal rain band that really serves as the border between the inner core and the outer core core region. So when we're talking about ventilation, for instance, as we did with tropical cyclone intensity change, we're generally not talking about the pathway that goes straight into the inner core, the puncher going straight to the center of the tropical cyclone, but rather environmental flow reaching into this outer core region where we see distant rain bands here to the east, here to the west, and here even further to the west. So thunderstorms within this region already have shorter lifespans and they're largely governed by the diurnal cycle. Within the inner core, thunderstorms are more or less quasi-steady, although they too have a diurnal cycle associated with them that we'll describe toward the end of this video here. But within the outer core, they're largely or more so governed by that diurnal cycle. They have their peak intensity during the warmest time of the day, during the late afternoon to early evening, and then they have their weakest intensity as you go through the night and into the early morning hours here. <clears throat> This is where air that is uh, being ventilated into the tropical cyclone ultimately is able to reach. It may cause the associated convective cells to weaken or altogether dissipate with cold downdrafts reaching to the lower levels that then flush into the inner core toward the principal rain band toward the eye wall itself. We do see these distant rain bands here with the uh, different cyclonic curvature to them here. When you have a landfalling tropical cyclone, it's not near the center, not with the principal or secondary rain bands, but usually with these distant rain bands where tornadic activity tends to be maximized, where you get the strongest vertical wind shear associated with the superposition of the cyclone's rotation and the large scale wind field within the favorable thermodynamic environment to allow for uh, tornadoes to develop. If we take a cross-section view, so the y-axis or up and down on this slide is the vertical direction. We have the center of the eye here at the center of the diagram, and we have radius going away from there on uh, either direction along the x-axis here. In our Carnot cycle approximation, air flows inward through and past the rain band, through and past any secondary or new eye wall that's forming toward the old eye wall, where it is forced to ascend. The bulk of it here is ascending with less in the rain band, less in the new or secondary eye wall. And it slopes gently 
outward as you go upward and then gives way to the outflow at larger radius. And I said earlier in this video that we talk a little bit about why that is the case. So we can think back to the idea of absolute angular momentum that we introduced when we were looking at the Hadley cell in the subtropical jet, for instance. So you have a center of rotation associated with the cyclone and due to its thermal structure with the warm anomaly maximized in the middle to upper troposphere, it has an intensity that is strongest near to the surface that then weakens as you go upward uh, within the ascending branch of the secondary circulation. However, because that rotational wind speed weakens as you go upward, absolute angular momentum has to, uh, sorry, not absolute angular momentum, but the distance from the center has to change in order for absolute angular momentum to be conserved. Ultimately, absolute angular momentum is approximately conserved as air comes inward, goes up, and goes out. So as air, uh, so as air goes up, and the horizontal rotation rate goes down, the radius has to go outward in order for absolute angular momentum to be conserved. And so that's why air that ascends within this uh, inner or primary eye wall here moves to larger radius, gives way to that outflow as you move to larger and larger altitudes. It's tied to the absolute the conservation of absolute angular momentum and the warm core structure of the tropical cyclone vortex here. Between this new eye wall and old eye wall or primary and secondary eye wall here, you have weak descent with surface fluxes helping to maintain some low level warmth and moisture here. So you get a region of stratiform precipitation roughly along this dashed line here that separates the boundary layer from the free atmosphere in this case. So you do still see organized weak precipitation here, but it's of that stratiform variety and not the deep convective variety they would expect to see within the rain bands or either the secondary or primary eye walls that we we see here. We can look at this in terms of just the primary and secondary eye walls here. We have the center in the bottom left, height is our y-axis coordinate here, and radius is our x-axis coordinate here. Air comes in at low levels, some of which ascends in a secondary eye wall that may or may not be present. The rest of it comes inward and ascends within the eye wall or whatever developing version of an eye wall may exist. And then both of these spread outward and then give way to outflow at larger radius. In the absence of this secondary eye wall, you get uh, inflow that extends over a shallow layer near the surface concentrated to this primary or inner eye wall. And so you get intense convective activity uh, forming here in those cases. Whereas once you get this secondary eye wall form in some cases, not all, you then cut off some of that inflow. This convective cell begins to intensify at the expense of this one here, noting this little weak descent here, plus the fact that all of these arrows do not are not directed into the inner eye wall here. Over time, the heating that is released within the thunderstorms that are generated within this uh, secondary eye wall here causes the eye wall to contract closer to the center and closer to the inner eye wall. As it does so, this forcing for descent becomes increasingly located on top of that inner or original eye wall. And as this uh, outer eye wall becomes more and more intense, instead of having a few of these arrows get through, none of them ultimately get through. So you end up growing the secondary eye wall and cutting off the source of warm, moist air for inflow to the inner eye wall and ultimately with descent superimposed upon it leads to it weakening over time. And that's what we describe as our eye wall replacement cycle. We can take a look at this not just in a schematic form, but in terms of actual data. We have a major hurricane here, a visible satellite here in the upper left, and a few different flight tracks are given by the red, blue, and yellow lines here. We have radar imagery corresponding to this satellite image here. Note that there is a single eye and eye wall indicated on the visible satellite. However, the radar data suggests that there is an inner eye wall with a moat region 
of lighter reflectivity, lower reflectivity surrounding it, and then an outer eye wall developing even further away from that uh, here. We can take a cross section through that here where we have the primary eye wall. The center of the storm is here in the bottom right. So this region of gray shading is the eye where there's no radar reflectivity. We have the old eye wall that extends up 14 or more kilometers here. And we have a new eye wall with shallower deep moist convection extending only up to about six kilometers uh, in this case. And between the two, we see weak descent associated with drying and this moat region of lighter, more stratiform precipitation between the two. If we take a look at a uh, rain band going a little bit further out from there, so this corridor here of brown, yellow, and purple or pink shading is a rain band associated with the same hurricane depicted on the previous slide. We have a very similar panel depicted here at bottom where we're looking at two different cells that we're taking a cross section through. In the top one, we're looking at a developing thunderstorm, and in the bottom one, we're looking at a mature thunderstorm. And for a developing thunderstorm, we see flow coming in from larger radius here from the right, ascending within the thunderstorm, and then being directed back outward in the form of outflow here. Although some air does continue to go inward from there toward the center. Whereas for this mature thunderstorm, we still have air coming in at low levels and it weakly ascends. But at this time, the thunderstorm core has begun to collapse precipitation is falling out quite rapidly from this, and you have descent somewhat inward of the ascent that we see here in our previous panel in the upper right, and then spreading inward toward the eye. This can occur even in the absence of ventilation by cooler, drier environmental air, just as the precipitation content within the cloud becomes too heavy for the cloud to be able to support an updraft as all of the precipitation is falling out. We call that hydrometeor loading. So if we take a look at a composite structure of these two, because these two features are occurring at the same time within any given convective cell or especially set of convective cells, we have air coming in at low levels, some of which ascends, slopes outward, and then gives way to outflow. And then just inside of that, we have descent that comes in and then leads to inflow toward the center of the cyclone here, combining with some of the flow that comes in at low levels and does not ascend significantly and then comes inward there as well. You still have to modify this air by surface fluxes as it tries to approach closer to the eye wall and toward the center of the storm in order to maintain an intense storm, but it's perhaps not as quite not quite as large of an extent as you would expect if you were ventilating with cooler, drier environmental air. So we can look at this in an idealized schematic view as well, where we have an eye with a surrounding eye wall, and we have an outer rain band, uh, in this case a principal rain band, giving this G or perhaps backward C type of shape here. You have your initial cells forming, becoming mature, and then ultimately decaying as you go down here. We see this same inward, upward, and outward motion here, as well as this same inward, slight descent, and then descending motion here uh, just inside of that feature in this bottom right panel. So the combination of panels B and C here gives you the total view in a vertical cross section. Height on the y-axis, distance across the center along the x-axis, view through the rain band. Now there are a couple of features, this J, uh, both in panel B as well as in panel A here, that's also referred to as SHWM or secondary horizontal wind maximum. We also have this LLWM here, which corresponds to the eye wall or low level wind maximum here. We're not going to talk about the specific processes that give way to this jet or to, uh, the secondary horizontal wind maximum. For that, I'll refer you to the posted lecture notes in case you're interested here. But it's not particularly relevant to our discussion, although you could invoke it to describe how the secondary eye wall may form from a principal rain band over the course of some period of time. So finally, in terms of this overview of tropical cyclone structure, we introduced this idea of a diurnal cycle. 
So very near to the center, within the eye wall, tropical cyclone thunderstorms are fairly persistent, so long as the storm is not being heavily sheared. You have consistent updrafts associated with the feature, so you have a relatively consistent intensity to the coldest cloud tops. However, as you move outward from that primary eye wall to any secondary eye wall that might exist, or to the primary or secondary rain bands, you start to see more of a diurnal signal in terms of when this convection is at its most intense. So in the outer rain bands, the diurnal cycle favors uh, thunderstorms being most intense, just like what we see here on land during the day, the afternoon into the early evening hours. But within the tropical cyclone's inner core, the opposite is true. You generate the greatest instability at night, when you have the greatest cooling at the top of the cloud mass that is present there, so you increase the lapse rates within the vertical column between the surface and the tropopause, and thus have your greatest thunderstorm intensity nearer to the center during the overnight hours. And so that's what these three bullets are ultimately trying to show. So what we have here in our diagram is two columns, one looking at different features from 100 to 300 kilometers, roughly within the inner core. So the dark brown is 100 kilometers, red is 200, gold is 300. And then here in the other column, we're looking at the outer core, 400 to 600 kilometer radius from the center. The green is 400, blue is 500, purple is 600 kilometers away. And we have the infrared satellite brightness temperature averaged around the cyclone uh, for each one of these radii in each of these panels. The y-axis is a little bit different in terms of numerical values, but the specific numerical values are not as important as the change with time. And time is the x-axis. We're looking over the course of two full days on the x-axis here. From 19 or 1845 local standard time, to 1845 local standard time two days later. In this case, we have the coldest brightness temperatures at 100 kilometers found during the local overnight hours, roughly four o'clock in the morning. And then as you go toward larger radius, this, become, this minimum at a given radius becomes found at later and later times. So that's what this red, black line that slopes up and to the right is intending to show early morning in the inner core, and then as you get to the outer core, you're looking at 16, 19, to even 22 UT, or local standard time. So you're looking at 4, 7, and 10 p.m., cycling back through as you get to uh, uh, overnight hours at smaller radius. The bottom panel just is the difference from one time versus the previous time in terms of the charts that you see here in the top row. So is less important, but helps to show this uh, outward trend as you go to larger and larger radius. So we can see this in infrared satellite imagery. In the upper left, we have an infrared satellite image in the local nighttime hours. The more green and red the shading, the more intense the thunderstorms, the colder the cloud tops. The bluer or light green shading depicts less intense thunderstorms, less, in, less cold cloud tops. So here in the local nighttime hours, you have this red ring that very nearly surrounds the center and a larger region of thunderstorms surrounding that within its primary rain band. But then during the local daytime hours, note how that primary rain band in particular is found at a larger distance than it was during the local nighttime hours. And this perhaps shows up a little bit better in the six hour infrared satellite difference that we see here. And in particular, here in the local daytime image in lower right, you have this circular region of reds, oranges, and whites with a region in particular on the west side of blues. The blues indicate where cloud top temperatures are increasing, and so thunderstorms are becoming weaker. And the reds, oranges, and whites depict where cloud top temperatures are cooling, where thunderstorms are becoming more intense. So we can see that expansion of that outer rain band between local night and local day very clearly in this six hour uh, infrared satellite difference going from this time versus this time here. 
So wrapping all of this up, we've introduced this idea of a primary circulation. This is primarily the horizontal flow with some weak inflowing component, giving way to horizontal flow with some weak outflowing component in the middle to upper troposphere. We introduce the secondary circulation as that which gains enthalpy along inflow, ascends over a deep layer and moves to increasingly large radius due to the conservation of absolute angular momentum as it goes upward, and then radial outflow uh, when you are near to the tropopause. Secondary eye walls and primary eye walls exist just outside of the eye, still distinctly within the inner core. The primary eye wall is where you would expect to find the radius of maximum winds, and the secondary eye wall gradually cuts off the inflow to the primary eye wall, and the heating that is found within the thunderstorms at the secondary eye wall helps to cause it to move inward, ultimately collapsing the primary or initial eye wall in the form of an eye wall replacement cycle. As you move outward from there, we have rain bands that represent linearly organized thunderstorms. Just as we see with mesoscale convective systems, where you have new developing storms on one end give way to mature storms and then ultimately decaying storms as you go to the other end, you see the same type of structure within tropical cyclone rain bands. Whether they be the bigger organized features like the primary or secondary rain bands, or more isolated features like you see within the distant rain bands. And there are distinct horizontal and vertical circulations in and through these features as we've demonstrated on previous slides. Thunderstorm activity between the rain bands and the outer core follows that distinct diurnal cycle where thunderstorm activity is favored during the overnight and early morning hours near to the center and during the afternoon and early evening hours as you get to larger and larger radius. And so that wraps up our discussion of the structure of a tropical cyclone. From here, now that we've introduced especially this in, up, and out structure, we want to look at how this mature structure, particularly that of the secondary circulation, responds to individual heating or momentum forcings. So until then, thanks for tuning in.